Hello everyone, hope you're doing well and welcome back to the Baking Analyst channel. On this channel, we cover everything from cryptocurrencies to economics, personal finance and decentralized finance. So if that sounds like something that's interesting to you, do consider leaving a like and subscribing to this channel. If you're completely new to the idea of decentralized finance and navigating the decentralized finance investing environment, I actually made an online course that's on Skillshare. You can access that at the link down below. It's probably short enough to fit within a free trial that you'll get using that link. And of course, you'll also have access to Skillshare's other range of courses if for whatever reason that does not float your boat. You can also jump into our Discord server, which is linked down below as well, where you can find a community of yield farmers and DeFi natives. There's a great learning resource and you can also see what projects everyone is getting involved in over there. So with that out of the way, let's jump right into today's video. Today, I'll be talking about what layer ones I'll be stacking during this bear market. Now, of course, while the title suggests that I'll be recommending coins in this video, I'll try not to show coins directly in this video simply because of how risky everything is right now however i will be giving you a framework to help you decide which layer ones are most likely to survive this bear market without any sort of catastrophic event this might not age well but let's jump right into it so if you're not sure what a layer one is a layer one is basically a platform that allows you to execute smart contracts on each of these layer ones have their own fee token or gas token which is used to pay for any sort of transaction on the network so as we know there is ethereum which is of course the most dominant of the layer ones then you have Binance Smart Chain where you have PancakeSwap and everything like that Polygon, Avalanche and of course Kronos from Crypto.com, Phantom so all of these can be considered layer ones in a way Polygon was sort of designed as a layer two however for most intents and purposes it functions very similarly to any other layer one protocol so let's look at how we can choose between all these different projects and see which have the highest chance of survival so when we look at what kind of layer ones we want to accumulate during this bear market especially as prices are down we want to first consider what makes a good layer one or l1 so first of all i would say there are three main factors that will go into my decision making and that will be that the layer one has to be functional it has to be interoperable, meaning that you can easily transfer funds in and out of the ecosystem. And it also has to have a strong backing. I'll be explaining each of these in turn. And let's first start with functional. For functional, I mean that the layer one should have concentrated liquidity. And concentrated liquidity is all about having all your liquidity in one place rather than fragmented across a lot of different liquidity pools. If you want to see what I mean by fragmented liquidity, you need to look no further than Melcomida with their Occam X Finance decentralized app, which just so happens to be the app with the highest total value locked on that platform. So as we can see, you have all these different versions of USDC, of MAD USDC, multi USDC, and basically liquidity of about 8 million is split into two meaning that this whole decentralized app becomes less usable for people who are trading larger amounts because you're just going to cause more slippage within each individual pool with each given trade. And I'll be going a bit into this whole versions of USDC thing a little later because that poses another risk all on its own. So the next one will be that you want to have basic functions present. The basic functions present include your exchange, which is your decentralized exchanges. There are your lending and borrowing like your Aave, as well as your NFTs, if you're into that kind of thing. Now, of course, a lot of layer ones have all of these three things. It's just that some of them have more developed infrastructure than others. So do look out for that. Just make sure that whatever you're going into has all the financial plumbing there. The next one that I'll be looking at is usability. So things like gas fees, right? Gas fees should ideally be low. Of course, Ethereum is an exception because of the first mover advantage and the network effects that they have. You also want it to have very good uptime. So what do I mean by uptime? Well, we had issues with things like RPCs. We have issues with things like transactions not being able to be submitted on some blockchains. I'm not going to name names here. But essentially, you want your blockchain to be functional most of the time and able to keep up with additional scale. And then, of course, you want speed because a chain wherein transactions take minutes or even hours to take place is not going to gain widespread adoption compared to a new chain that is able to function quickly. And of course, we have the whole RPC issue. So this is a way essentially of how you can access the blockchain in the first place. It might not have to do with anything about the underlying tech, but if we can't access it and can't make transactions, then what is the point? Usability, basically make sure that the chain has these four factors. In terms of good performance, in my opinion, in these regards, they include things like Matic, they include things like Phantom, as well as Binance Smart Chain. Those have been pretty reliable 
in recent days. And then you want the chain to be interoperable so that it is easy for developers to port over their decentralized apps and infrastructure and develop out that ecosystem. A lot of you might balk at the concept of EVM compatible being one of the considerations in this case. And of course, we know what you're referring to. You're referring to Solana and how Solana might be a huge ecosystem that does not necessarily depend on Ethereum virtual machine compatibility. Well, as we can see, Solana is actually also recognizing the need to be somewhat interoperable in the long term. So we do have a project called Neon, which is an Ethereum compatible environment on Solana. So this is definitely a very good development that we will be looking at and we will be watching closely as this thing comes to fruition. The reason why EVM compatibility is so important is because, as I mentioned earlier, it allows developers to move their applications across different platforms really easily. You get these tomb forks, you get these pancake forks, and all the other kinds of forks that you want in the DeFi world. So low barriers to entry to development is really what you want. You also want to be able to quickly bridge your assets in and out of that ecosystem and not only rely on just one bridge. We'll get to that now that we've seen what has happened with Harmony 1. The final bit of functional that I want to talk about is this concept of native stable coins. Why are native stable coins important? Well, native stable coins are important because first of all, they help concentrate liquidity. Second of all, they help get rid of bridge risk. Now, of course, a lot of you have been around for the failure of Evo DeFi bridge. That bridge failed because it went insolvent after minting a lot of USDC on the Oasis Emerald Power Chain into Valley Swap without actually having the USDC and USDT required in the contract address to allow people to bridge out to other chains. And then that ended up making up about 70 to 80% of Oasis total value lock. When you think about it, in comparison to things like Wormhole USDC and Seller USDC on the Oasis chain, this Evo DeFi issued USDC, which wasn't apparently backed, became the de facto native stablecoin on Oasis chain. However, since there existed all these risks that it was only able to be redeemed via this bridge, which turned out to be insolvent, we do see the problem of not having an official native stablecoin on a given ecosystem. So what are some examples of ecosystems with native stablecoins? Well, Kronos does have native stablecoins. You can, of course, use this USDC on Kronos, send it directly into the Crypto.com app and spend it on your card, at least for now, unless they decide to pull a Celsius. However, even if they do pull a Celsius, there is some liquidity around on all the different bridges. You can see that if you use the Connext or Polynet bridge, you find that you're using the same USDC as you would if you want to try to send it to crypto.com and you're doing the same thing if you want to do that on the multi-chain bridge. You can see that the multi-chain bridge also allows you to send the same USDC. So other examples of this include Matic, which has their own USDC as well, and Avalanche, which in fact has worked with Circle. You know, Circle announced the launch of USD coin on Avalanche, meaning that you'd be directly able to redeem your USDC from Avalanche from Circle's accounts. This is a really good development. You know, Avalanche probably a good one to watch as well. Now that we've covered functionality and interoperability, let's talk a bit about backing. As we all know, this whole bear market situation has a lot of weaker crypto companies not doing so well. We have seen bankruptcies, insolvencies and basically people running out of money so when you want to see a platform survive and continue to develop there has to be some sort of incentive for developers to go there to build anything in the first place so this strong backing for a layer one ecosystem is essential if you want more decentralized apps and innovations to be built on that platform and that can include things like funding for devs it can include backing by large investors which would lead to greater resilience in a bear market. To see what I'm talking about, you can look at all the centralized exchange backed layer ones, such as Kronos and Binance Smart Chain. They started by launching hundreds of millions of dollars worth of accelerator programs and ecosystem growth programs. Binance did a 500 million round. And then you also have foundations like Polkadot, which did a 250 million AUSD stablecoin fund. And if I'm not wrong, and as I've been using Revolutes, they do seem to be giving out quite a bit of free polka dots on that app. Leave a link down below as well if you want to participate in that. So, you know, they're giving out free polka dots to encourage adoption. They are investing in their ecosystem. So, if they have all this 
money in their war chest right now to deploy and invest in development. It is a good barometer to use to see who is going to survive this bear market. So all in all, I have named some coins in this video. And while this is definitely not financial advice for you to go out and ape your savings into them today, I hope this video has given you a logical thought process when choosing which layer one protocols or smart contract platforms you would like to accumulate during this time of discounted prices. So with that being said, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.